Hello, I'm a Democrat, and I'm running for President of the United States. My voting history shows that I've done everything I can to support our minority groups. I want to end the war against illegal immigration, because, after all, they're citizens too. However, my opponent rejects the idea of such acceptance. He's even been seen stopping Hispanics in the street and accusing them of being illegal. From drafting legislation to get free food stamps and welfare, to personally distracting the Border Patrol for easier passage, I am truly here for the people. And yes, it's true that I voted in favor of funding for Planned Parenthood. I not only advocate, but promote a woman's right to have an abortion. In fact, last week I personally aborted an entire class of third graders. Yet your Republican nominee has been seen at abortion clinics, yelling at rape victims, telling them it was the will of God to bear their child. He has no respect for anyone who isn't also a rich white man, whereas I will give you all free health care, free food, and free abortions. Myself. He forces his religion on an entire nation, whereas I oppose religion in schools and in the home. He tries to portray a healthy marriage, but we all know that's really his sister. On November 6th, Vote for a strong woman fighting for you, not an inbred Texan with a spoon-fed Harvard degree and stupid. I'm your Democratic candidate, and I approve this message. Funded by Tampon, the American Minority Political Outreach Network. Rob Stark. He's the biggest celebrity in the North, but his father was a traitor... He arrested his own mother, his bastard brother deserted the Night's Watch, and he couldn't defend his own castle. Worst of all, Rob Stark hasn't stopped the wildlings from invading our lands and taking our jobs. He even has an illegal alien for a nanny. And now he wants to be king in the north? King? Some people say he's really a wolf. Some people say he eats dead people. We can't wait until it's too late. Send a raven to Winterfell now and tell Rob Stark to go back home. Stop eating dead people and defend the damn wall. This ad paid for by Crossbows, GPS. Daenerys Targaryen. She says she is the mother of dragons. But would you trust her with your kids? Her father was a maniac. She palled around with Dothraki terrorists. She asked the city of Car for a government bailout. Then she lost three baby dragons after placing them in an unlocked wooden box. An unlocked wooden box. This Khaleesi wants to be queen of the Seven Kingdoms. But can she be trusted? Daenerys Targaryen. Wrong for dragons. Wrong for the realm. Paid for by the committee to protect dragons. We don't know anything about him. He was never really vetted. Is he really the true-born son of Robert Baratheon? All over the Seven Kingdoms, people are asking the same question. Who is the real King Joffrey? The people of Westeros are hurting. Winter is coming. Crop yields are falling. And the price of fuel is going up. The gods of peat moss is through the thatched roof. And this young and inexperienced king takes advice from a whoremongering imp and has launched an illegal war in the north. What is King Joffrey hiding? This is not our kind of family values. King Joffrey. What a bastard. What a bastard. Paid for by the Inbaratians for freedom. On the battlefield, there's a saying America's military men and women live by. Never leave a fallen warrior behind, ever. Off the battlefield, Wounded Warrior Project operates with the same goal. We leave no warrior behind. Wounded Warrior Project is a nonprofit organization created to help our men and women returning home with the scars of war. Whether those scars are physical or mental, we're here to make sure that they heal. And whether it's helping those with post-traumatic stress disorder live a normal life again or giving much-needed support to injured warriors and veterans' hospitals. Because no one deserves our help more than the men and women who risk their lives to keep us safe. Wounded Warrior Project. We never leave a fallen warrior behind. Ever. Learn more about what we do at WoundedWarriorProject.org.
The following letters were written by our troops. My dear fellow Americans, I truly appreciate your support. I was starting to wonder if people had forgotten about us over here, but then one of my buddies showed me this website, and now as tears are streaming down my face, I can see for sure that you haven't. Private Emily B., U.S. Army. It's so heartwarming to see the American people not letting the men and women of the armed forces be forgotten. Your letters make a group of grown men, battle-hardened and gruff, act like a bunch of kids around a Christmas tree. Thanks. Staff Sergeant Matthew H., U.S. Army. Your support may be the most important thing our troops can carry with them, but don't take our word for it. Take theirs. To show your support, visit americasupportsyou.mil. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Defense and the Ad Council. not a big government or bust, and I know because, of course, as I do every day, I check today, and it has not changed. It is hump day, wedness day, Wednesday, April the 8th, near of our Lord, 2015, and we had snow here in New Hampshire. In fact, some models were predicting as much as two to four inches, but uh, I think all we're going to get is a dusting, thankfully. Yeah, that, that, that two to four inches had some people scared, uh, you know, because here it is, April the 8th, and we're getting a snowstorm. And I've always said, you know, it, we're never out of the woods as far as having a major snowstorm until May 1st. Then we can rightfully uh, say that winter is over, although there have been some instances where Mother Nature has uh, Jack Frost has talked to Jack Frost, and Jack Frost has talked to Mother Nature and delivered us quite the belt of a snowstorm in May. And there was even one year it was in June. But for the most part, once May 1st here uh, gets here, we are 99% most likely out of the woods and heading towards summer. But uh, that is not always the case before May the 1st. As in today, it was rather cold and and wet, and obviously it was cold enough for it to snow. So people have to turn on their heat and go chop some more wood and toss in their their wood stoves and fireplaces to keep warm. Thank you, global warming. I do have some global warming, man-made global warming news for you a little bit later. You're not going to believe it, Um, but... you know, they're at it again, and now they're, they're – look, I've told you, these people are crazy. They're going to try every which way but Sunday, and if they could, they'd try Sunday too, to get you to either believe their BS, their lies in man-made global warming, or to force you to believe it through, through law, rule, and regulation. I've uh, got some news on that, though. That'll be up later. First, I want to talk about the uh, – Yohar Sarnayev guilty verdict. No, uh, for, uh, look, it, we had a TV station and radio station here that jipped in 
um, programming to talk about nothing because there was the, the jury says they have a verdict. So for about 20 minutes, they really talked about nothing while all the parties involved were um, assembled back in the courthouse. Look, I understand it's, a, it's, it's an important case, but it's not that important because I don't think anybody was surprised by the outcome, really. There was no surprise about the outcome. The, the, the man was obviously guilty. I mean, he admitted that he, that he did this stuff, so there was no question of his guilt. Uh, you know, he and his brother decided to go on a bombing spree, and they got caught. Thankfully so. However, let me bring something to light about this story. You know, we all talk about how, you know, this guy's, you know, justice has to be done. This guy has got to pay. And now, since the verdict is in, he's guilty on all 30 counts, uh, which some of the counts are really stupid. Because, you know, it's, it, you, and this goes to prove, this is a side note, this goes to prove that we have too many laws on the books. Because, let me give you an example. Let's say you're doing, it's late at night, there's nobody on the highway, you're doing 75 and a 65. Well, you get, over, you get pulled over and you get a speeding ticket for doing 75 and a 65, Right. Right. Well, maybe the officer who pulls you over decides to give you a ticket for reckless driving. And then maybe he decides to give you a ticket for, you know, uh, 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 using a dangerous instrument or something. Now, it, you, haven't, you didn't do anything differently. All you did, you weren't driving dangerously. All you did was drive 75. But they, we have at least three laws that you've just broken with one incident. You see what I'm saying? There's too many laws in the books. And just because there, there were 30 counts doesn't mean that he did anything any worse. It's just that there are so many laws in the books that, you know, if you jaywalk now, it, could, you could, it used to be that you just got a ticket for jaywalking, you know, not crossing uh, at the crosswalk. Now it's, you know, jaywalking. Uh, it's endangering the motorist. It's, uh, you know, um, uh, endangering the welfare of your own being or what have you. There, there, just a ton of things for doing one thing. That's all it is. And that, that actually leads to oppression. That type of legal system, law system, leads to oppression because there's just too many laws. You know, I, I think, you know, just one or two of the laws was probably enough to get this guy. Uh, now they move on to the phase of uh, of a trial called the um, the sentencing phase or sentencing trial, and now is the time when 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 their people have to decide. You know, those in the legal system involved in the case have to decide whether he gets life in prison. Or he gets the death penalty. Yeah, you know, I know there are people out there, and uh, some in the clergy. Yeah, you, know, you know, think about this: clergy. And Obama was out there a few days ago disparaging Christians as not being loving, and here you are, some some Christians out there crying, "No, just give him life. We we shouldn't kill him." But I I guess those Christians aren't loving and kind, according to Obama. But now we're moving into that phase where they're going to have to decide. You know, give him life or give him death. And look, I, I'm I would be shocked because of the current revenge mentality over this shocking, over his shocking crime, and the results, the end results of his shocking crime. If he did, I would be surprised if he did not get the death penalty, even. In Massachusetts, liberal Massachusetts, I would be shocked because the, the man, obviously, you know, according to our laws, 
deserves the death penalty. Uh, look, I understand. He, he's young. What is he? He's, he's, I don't know how. He's under 25, I, I, I do believe. And that's sad, but you have to understand his bombs killed a little boy. I think the little boy wasn't even 12 years old. Yeah, he has a price and penalty to pay. I don't think that if you if you if you sit him in a jail cell for the rest of his life, he will ever come to regret what he did. You know, it's like Char- uh, with Charles Manson. I mean, that that man did all kinds of horrible things, and I don't think he's I don't th- today he doesn't regret it. In fact, he you know warns us don't don't let him out, don't parole him. He warns us. Every time he's up for parole, you, you better not let me out. Oh, no, it'd probably be a bad thing if you let me out. But for Sarnayev, you know, you know there, there are a lot of, if you, what, three people that died in the bombing, plus a, a police officer was killed by his brother, not by him, but still, uh, due in part because of him. So four people plus a criminal, five people total lost their lives because of this incident. So should we make it a six? According to the law, I have no issue with putting him down. I don't. You know, even as a Christian, I can say it simply because, look, I'm to forgive him because I am a Christian. But that doesn't mean forgiveness. You just let him go. And it doesn't mean you forget. That is, that's something different. You can still forget. You know, you can forgive somebody for wronging you. It doesn't mean that you forget it. And it doesn't mean that you, you put yourself in a position where you allow them to do it again. For instance, you know, you, you have um, you have a your your child, let's say. You know, your adult your twenty year old child is living with you. And there's money sitting on your dresser. Say a hundred bucks. And your twenty year old child is he's out of work or looking for a job, what have you, coming home from school, what have you. He wants money, he sees your hundred dollars on your dresser and he takes it. Now you can forgive him. You can forgive your child for doing that. But it does not mean that you have to go ahead and put another hundred dollars in the dresser. You can remember what he did and remember to lock up your wallet so he doesn't take it again. That there see the difference there? It's the same thing with Sarnayev. We can forgive him of his acts, of his deeds. It doesn't mean that he's free from justice. It doesn't mean that he look, you can apologize all you want to. It doesn't mean you're now absolved of any wrongdoing that you've done. You've got to make that right. Now, how do you replace limbs? How do you replace lives? How do you repair broken and shattered lives? Well, you can't. Uh, it would be one thing if he could just say, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Let me let me pray and bring them back to life. That's not possible. It's not, it's not going to happen. So it does not mean that justice stops because we forgive them or they say they're sorry. And they can, you know, be full on believe in their own hearts and and come from their, the bottom of their own hearts that they really are sorry and they repent. It does not mean they are allowed to get off. Period. I don't know why the left doesn't, doesn't seem to, to understand this thing, this sort of thought. You know, saying you're sorry is one thing. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But just because you say, I'm sorry, you know, with the tears flowing down your your your, your face and your, your your head hung low and your shoulders hunched forward, 
and you're sobbing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can truly be sorry. Doesn't mean you're off the hook, though. I can truly forgive you. Doesn't mean you're off the hook. This young man did something very, very bad. He got caught, and he has to pay the price. Plain and simple. Whatever the price is, he's got to pay it. Now, I am sure he knew what the price could be. It could have been the ultimate price. It could have been his life. At some point, even when, you know, when he was being hunted down, his brother paid the ultimate price before he got to trial. Brother was killed. Could have happened to uh, the younger Sar- Sarnayev. They knew the risk, and yet they did the deed anyway. Now he has to pay the price. I do not feel sorry for him. I do not have empathy for him. I do not have sympathy for him. He did the dastardly deed. Now he has to pay. And if our system says because he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which he is because he admits he did it and participated, if we follow the letter of the law and he deserves to be put to death, then so be it. He knew the potential risk, and he lost. Now, let me mention something about how he got caught, which is pretty, you know, kind of scary in itself. And I'm not talking about uh, the the, the gunfights, you know, the gun battles that, that, that led to, uh, you know, an officer and his older brother's death. But I'm talking about the method by which our government went, went about to catch them. Now, you have to understand that Boston and, and a few communities were basically put on martial law, curfew. You weren't supposed to be out in the streets. And this was just for a crime, folks. I mean, if this, you know, we have to get the bad guys, so they, they, they were telling us. So if that's the case, then why, is, why isn't the city put on a lockdown every time there's a crime committed until they catch the perpetrator? This is what they did. We're talking businesses were shut down. People were supposed to stay off the streets while the police roamed everywhere looking for these two. That's kind of scary that we, we – our government was able to institute basically martial law just to catch a criminal, and the vast majority of people were okay with it. Now, I'd, be, I'd be like, are you kidding? How can you possibly be okay with that? Well, we needed to catch him. What, you couldn't catch him any other way? You had to institute basically martial law for a crime. It's not like we're in the middle of a war or something, and you know, uh, or there was a terrorist attack like in um, uh, a, a New York City, with lots of devastation, or lots of death. No, 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 no. It, it, they just wanted to be able to catch them, so they told us. What it really was was a test to see how the American people, at least some populations, would be willing to accept a martial law in position for any, just about any reason. And all they have to do now is just say the next time they want to do something like that, is just say it's for public safety. Hey, this was for the public safety that we have. We had this imposed this travel ban and, and quarantine and curfew. So people wouldn't get hurt by the cops basically. But, I'm saying to myself, you guys are accepting this? I mean, I know we're talking about Massachusetts, but I'm saying you're accepting this? This is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Don't get me wrong. It's a very good thing that, that they caught the two. And it's a good thing that one of them didn't survive. Trust me, I believe that's a good thing. Is it a good thing 
in a free society that has a constitution and people, the citizens, have rights to have those rights trampled upon because of one criminal or two criminals. Now, make no mistake about it. Yes, we view that crime as being horrendous, but make no mistake, it was still a crime. It, 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 they're, they're one, it was just two of them. There were, there weren't, they knew who they were looking for, by the way. So it's not as if they're thinking, well, you know, in, like New York City, there were 19 hijackers. Well, what if there are that many uh, in Boston? No, they knew who they were looking for. They knew there, there were two that they were after. They knew what they looked like. They knew their names. They knew who they were. Law enforcement at all levels knew who they were looking for. But yet and still, they decided to impose this quasi-martial law and impose an entire city or two or three to shut down. And people eagerly went along with it. Now, you've got to be reminded of this from time to time. You know, Benjamin Franklin, and I quote him loosely, those who give up a little bit of of liberty to secure more security deserve neither liberty nor security and indeed will not have either liberty nor security. Because you have to understand, you can probably say, well, you know, hey, all these criminals are running amok. Well, who's a bigger criminal? The street thug or the government agent? The street thug is violating your human and constitutional rights. Absolutely. But it's, why is it different when a government agent does exactly the same thing? There is no difference. It's one and the same. Another human being is trying to tell you that you don't have any rights except the rights that they allow you to have. Hey, think about it. You don't have any rights... Because the government gives you rights. Well, that's not what our Constitution said, but says, but this is what they're trying to make you believe, and all too often, many of you do believe this. The government grants rights. Therefore, if the government grants you a, a right, it can take that right away. It can decide that you don't really have a right, but it's a pr- privilege to be able to do this, this, or that. Again, that is not what our Constitution says. But yet what what Massachusetts did when searching for the Sarnia brothers is they were saying, you know what? We are suspending your right to be free and travel free around the city. You don't have that right. Well, actually, you do. But because so many people believe that the government gives them rights, therefore giving the government power to take away that right, they didn't even question why the government needed to shut down the city just to find two people. Why did they need to shut down the city to find two, the duo people? They didn't have to shut down to do that. They shouldn't have shut down to do that. They did shut down to do that, and in so doing, even though they caught their criminal, or their two criminals, they committed a bigger crime upon a lot more people, and that's the crime of taking away the individual freedom and liberty of every single one of the city citizens. Come on down to the newest pub in Texas, Rednecks, where our beer cans are always full. Don't ask what brand it is, because it all tastes like warm piss. So if you're celebrating a special occasion, like marrying your sister. I do. I did. Or being named Employee of the Month at Walmart, you're going to want to come celebrate with us at Rednecks Bar and Cantina. And remember, every Friday and Saturday, we have our famous tooth contest. Whoever has the most teeth wins a pair of John Deere mud flaps and a buttery corn on the cob. There's plenty of parking space 
you to drive your house over to Rednecks and come on in and have a hell of a time. We're located right next to Big Al's truck stop, right across the street from the KKK headquarters. Homos and minorities, not welcome. In a world where beer is served warm and flat, there is only one hope for beer drinkers. The Wooden Tap Bar and Grill presents Perfect Tap, an epic invention that ensures your favorite draft beer tastes better here than it does anywhere else. Critics call Perfect Tap mesmerizing. This is the way draft beer is supposed to taste. If you drink just one beer this year, make sure it comes from Perfect Tap. Now pouring exclusively at all four Wooden Tap locations. Wooden Tap! Come as you are. Ripper the Clown may be a cartoon character come to life, but you trust him with your votes on November 4th? Ripper the Clown wants to be Mayor, Sheriff, Comptroller, and Senator of Ripper County, but in a recent debate, he admitted that he didn't even know what a Comptroller was. And then he offered free gas cards and fast food gift certificates to anyone who voted for him. He also offered free autographed copies of his new award-winning zombie novel, The Life and Mimes, and Zombie Apocalypse of Ripper the Clown for those who cast votes in his favor. These are all violations of America's occasionally enforced voting laws. Do you want this inexperienced and sneaky clown with his finger on the button? Don't vote for Ripper the Clown. Paid for by people who hate Ripper the Clown. The people who hate Ripper the Clown are responsible for the content of this ad. Let's talk about Bob Sweeney, Lambert, Benton Housing, Cavanaugh, Rope Puller, Havisham, McDougal, Subway, Bentley, Cavanaugh, Buffalo, Nickel, Jones, Rosenberg, Radio Frequency, Smith. What do you know? Did you know that he's a naval hero? He single-handedly fought the Battle of Trafalgar in the waiting pool at the community center, freeing us from French tyranny. Did you know that he's an adventurer? Fighting the elements, he climbed Mount Everest in the frozen food section of the local grocery store to prove that anyone can achieve their dreams. He's a humanitarian. He found another cure for smallpox when, on a rainy day, climbed his aluminum ladder to the power lines to rescue a stray sperm whale. An energy pioneer. He discovered an unyet named natural resource when he chewed the gum from underneath all the tables at the local pizza joint. And did you know that the only salary he takes is a few pieces of string, peat moss, and the occasional crow feather? Naval hero, adventurer, humanitarian, energy pioneer, and philanthropic volunteer. That's Bob Sweeney, Lambert, Bettenhouse, Cavanaugh, Rook Pillar, Havisham, McDougal, Subway, Bentley, Cavanaugh, and Buffalo, Nickel, Jones, Rosenberg, Radio Frequency, Smith. On Tuesday, remember to punch number 7 and vote for Bob Sweeney, Lambert, Benton Housing, Cavanaugh, Rope Puller, Havisham, McDougal, Subway, Bentley, Cavanaugh, Buffalo, Nickel, Jones, Rosenberg, Radio Frequency, Smith for Village Idiot. He's what this city needs to feel better in the eyes of the world. Paid for by the friends of Bob Sweeney, Lambert, Benton Housing, Cavanaugh, Rope Puller, Havisham, McDougal, Subway, Bentley, Cavanaugh, Buffalo, Nickel, Jones, Rosenberg, Radio Frequency, Smith. <laughs>
that, the number that you can call this evening if you wish to join me live here on the Rod Eccles Show and join and talk to your lovable host, El Rod, is 603-835-3224. And again, the number is 603-835-3224. I'd like to take this time to begin to welcome all the new listeners out there uh, who are starting to listen via some of the syndicated uh, places out there that are playing the Rod Echo Show, especially if you're if you are if you are listening in a uh, replay podcast, um, then thank you for listening, and don't forget that you can catch the show over on Blog Talk Radio uh, between eight and ten p.m. And there are a number of different other networks out there. And beginning next week, we'll start to tip our hats to each and every one of those uh, networks every night. So we'll, we'll uh, give a quick 30-second blurb to each one, a uh, different one every night, because uh, really want to thank them for coming on board and seeing what we have to offer here and, and, and thank them for believing that I have a voice that, um, that needs to be heard. And so uh, and they think I thank them for thinking that uh, giving me the opportunity to do that. It's um, it is an honor. It is a true honor, and I I will strive to live up to the excellence. Now, uh, again, you know, every once in a while, I'm sure there are going to be technological glitches, but we are working to make sure that those do not pop up. I am not resign. I don't give up. By the way. I, I'm not one that gives up easily. In any event, hey, did you, everybody's talking about uh, this nuclear Iran deal. And a lot of people are not happy with it. And if you were to listen, if you listen to Obama talk about this every once in a while, you, you'll get the, you know, you'll kind of get the, uh, the gist that, well, maybe he's not all that thrilled about it either. Or maybe he just doesn't – he's not thrilled about, about uh, uh, the criticism about it. And, you know, I find it funny by listening to, to a lot of the pundits and a lot of people who called in the various different talk shows over the past couple of days about this thing. And it's kind of interesting that people would just sort of give up for one main reason. You know, because they say, well, hey – they're going to get it anyway. What difference does it make if they get it now or if they get it in five years or 10 years or 15 years? They're going to get it. And then, then they'll follow up with, well, you know, the Soviet Union, the old, old Russia had, had nuclear weapons, and they never used them. So they're, compa- they're comparing apples and oranges here. What they're saying, what they're, what they're failing to realize is, is that the old Soviet Union – which, you know, it included Putin, by the way, he was KGB, uh, the old Soviet Union, they didn't want to die. They were, you know, just dictators and, and, and Marxists and that type of thing. They wanted to rule over people. They wanted to rule over people. They didn't want their people to die, and they didn't want to die. The difference with the Iranians here is, so, so with the Russians, there was, excuse me, with the Soviets, there was this, this idea of mutually assured destruction. Okay, Soviet Union, if you launch, we're going to launch. And we have just as many, if not more, nukes than you do, so you probably will not survive this exchange. A great number of your, of your fellow citizens will not survive this exchange. So there was this no, notion of mutually assured destruction so the soviets realized by having a nuclear war they couldn't win you you ever see the the movie war games you know in the end the computer is going through all these different scenarios and then comes up with you know the fact that you know it's like tic-tac-toe you can't win there's no there's no winner in an all-out nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the United States. Nobody, that would kept, you could say this, kept both sides in check. Seriously. But now, with Iran 
they don't have the same moral mentality as the Soviet Union. This is why you cannot let them have a nuclear weapon ever, because they believe, their form of Islam believes that it, 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 at least within the Middle East, but the whole world, in order to bring in paradise on earth, this old earth has to go out in war and fire and destruction. They want to die so they can achieve and get, you know, be martyrs and get their 72 virgins and all that kind of stuff in a utopia. They want to be the heroes so that Allah will put them here in his utopia. That is what they believe. They want to usher in the utopia. If they get the bomb, they will see that as a gift from Allah, and that means it must be used. It cannot be you know, stuck in a silo somewhere and not used. They must use it. They have to go ahead and try to destroy Israel. They have to try to destroy all the infidels, which includes the entire West and the United States. They have to destroy us. If they have a weapon that can do that, you better believe they will try to use it. So this stupid, idiotic notion, well, you know, hey, the Soviet Union had them, and we didn't get into a nuclear war with them. Look, this is different. We're talking apples and oranges here. There is, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. I don't know where, where you know, even some people on the right have this mentality, which is driving me insane. I mean, are you really trying to tell me that you believe that the mullahs in Iran are exactly like, you know, the old Soviet Politburo? Really? You believe they're like Khrushchev or Lenin or, oh, hey, hey, Lenin was a pretty badass, you know. He killed uh, millions of Russians to get what he get his way. You know, Gorbachev, you think, you think the mullahs are like Gorby? Uh, this sort of, they're not thinking. They're following some stupid lamestream media soundbite. You know, it's no big deal. What you're going to end up with is a nuclear arms race in the hands of bunches of dangerous countries that should not ever have them. Because they do not have the discipline nor the moral compass to control their urge and itch to push the damn button. I mean, this is so bad that you've got two former secretaries of state from diametrically opposed administrations. Henry Kissinger and Schultz, Charles Schultz. Now, if you don't know who Henry, Henry Kissinger is, he was, um, he was a, uh, uh, the, the, the Secretary of State, I do believe, for uh, Nixon, Richard M. Nixon. And Schultz, obviously, was, you know, well, actually, he was, uh, uh, he was under Reagan. Why is my mind going blank on Schultz? I was, I was actually trying to think of uh, Colin Powell, but... Uh, under Clinton, but uh, Colin Powell and Schultz definitely do not look alike. Uh, you know, one's a one's a tall old white guy, and one's a well, not short, a black guy. Um, yeah, they definitely don't look alike. But here, here you have, but, but their ideas, you know. Let's be honest, uh, Kissinger. Uh, it, it does not, and we've seen his what Kissinger believes in over the years is not really Reagan esque. Not, he's not. He's more like a you know a, a, a limp wristed lame duck, you know, limpy ducky, the wishy washy. Uh, he would he would fit in with Bonnier. But this guy. Kissinger and Schultz, they say, Iran deal brings region closer to nuclear war. And let me tell you something. It's not the region because there's no way in hell you're going to contain a nuclear war in a small region like the Middle East. 
Oh yeah, you're. You know, I I know that we here in the United States we often uh, joke about. Well, some people are not really joking, but we often joke about. You know, you know. To, well, hey, why do we spend so much time and money on on Iraq or Afghanistan or with Iran? Just turn them, you know, turn turn them into uh, uh, glass. You know, turn the countryside into glass, meaning you know, drop nukes on them and be done with it. Well, the problem is, is that the area is so small. That geographically speaking, it's very small. Not to mention we've got one of our friends over there, uh, you know, uh, Israel. They wouldn't avoid the fallout, literally. But see, the point is, is that you've got those over there that, uh, uh, look, people are saying, well, look, you've got Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan and, 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 and a Qatar and a few others out there who are, who are trying to fight against Iran in, in Yemen. Well, understand that none of them over there really want Israel there. Don't, don't think it's because it, in this particular case, it's not the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's not the case, you know, hey, well, to a certain degree, you might, uh, you, you know, there has been leaked information that, that Jordan and Saudi Arabia has, have seemingly agreed to let uh, Israel use their airspace in order to attack Iran to keep them from getting the bomb. So in this particular, to that extent, you might say the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But after all that's said and done, don't you know? If they take out Iran, do not doubt me that you know Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia will turn their attention to Israel to get rid of them. But they can't. The, the reason is is that they they know what the Iranian form of Islam is all about. And it scares the rest of them to death because they don't happen to necessarily believe in in bringing on an apocalyptic future in order to uh, uh, bring in utopia on Earth. They don't they don't particularly subscribe to that religious theorem, but Iran does, and they don't care if they die. In fact, they want to die. The Soviet leaders didn't want to die. They didn't really want the majority of their people to die. So you tell me where the, where the similarity is. There aren't any similarities between Iran today and the old Soviet Union. The Soviet Union wanted to survive. Iran wants the new utopia. And the only way to get it is if we all die. Did I make myself clear on this? The reason why you do not let Iran have a bomb is because it is not a case that they may use it. It is a case of they will use it, and the only question is when. So the question is, is once you let them have it, the question becomes, well, when are they going to use it? Are they going to use it today or next month or next year? They're going to use it. I look logic in their own rhetoric tells us so. Now, hey, if they don't actually believe in the utopia on Earth and they really don't want to die, then that's fantastic. Then no, they won't use it. But let me ask you this: Are you really willing to bet the entire world's population's lives on that? I'm not. I'm going to assume the worst in that they actually mean what they say. I, I don't know how, how else to put it. It isn't going to be if you let Iran have the bomb. It isn't a question of them using it or not. Well, they, they, they won't use it. It's only a matter of que- It's only a question of when. Are they definitely going to use it? Because they definitely will. All right, you could be wrong. I hope I am on this one. The problem is, is with all the evidence out there, it's pointing to the fact that I'm right. And the, the problem with me being right, if they get the bomb, 
is that there's not going to be anybody left to say for me to say, see, I told you so. Just saying. I, I, I don't. You know, it's just, it's absolutely. Uh, moving on to another topic because this, it, it, it makes no sense. I, it, it, to let them, I don't. I, I have no idea what's what's going on or going through. But I don't think Obama really wants to bring in a. You know, it, maybe he is a maybe he is a Muslim, in, in, you know, closet Muslim. I don't care about that part. I mean, I don't believe what goes on in his mind is anything the same as what goes on in in, in Iranian mullah's mind. I, I don't think it's the same. So I don't know where he's he, look. The guy might. Some people say that he's been hypnotized. You know, it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings thing in The Return of the King, you know, uh, where the Rohan king is has been possessed by Sol, uh, Solomon. And, you know, he's not – some people are saying, hey, Obama's kind of like a puppet. His strings are being pulled from outside. And you know, to, to all you Bilderberg and Illuminati type of uh, uh, nut job conspiracy theorists, let me t- let me tell you something. If your conspiracies are right, then it's all about them wanting to rule a planet. Well, there has to be a planet with people on it for them to rule. They don't want complete total annihilation of this planet. Iran does. So I'm sure that if they're pulling Obama's strings. They know for a fact that if you're going to give a nuclear bomb to somebody, you're not going to give it to Iran because it means everybody in the Illuminati or the Bilderberg or whoever they are, Rothschild, it means their deaths too. And if if they want to rule and have all the money, then they're sure as hell they don't want – I don't know. Are you telling me then that that the Bilderbergs and the Illuminati or the Rothschild, they're really just Muslims? Who who want to die and 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 and, and go to Allah and heaven and and uh, receive their seventy two versions and usher in uh, the utopia here on earth? Is it are you tell is that what you're saying? Because that's what you're obviously saying. If you believe that this is what they want, this is why I don't believe in all these. You know these when you try to when you start taking apart these conspiracy theorists, you start taking apart their argument by historical fact, by documentation, and by logic. It falls apart. Yet they still believe it. It's just amazing. They still believe it. But hey, do, do you think that the uh, you think the the Bilderbergs want to die? Well, no, they don't want to die. No, oh, right. they don't. They don't want to die. They want to rule everything. They want to own everything. Well, if you know Iran blows everything up, what's going to be left to own and rule? Uh, well, probably nothing. But they still want to do it. Okay, so they're, then they're probably not for Iran having the bomb either. I, I guess that sort of logic escapes them. Hey, I want to give a shout out to somebody um, that we that almost every single one of us know. Yet we don't realize that we know him. We don't realize that we know him, but we know him well. From our childhood. Unfortunately, many children today, many millennials probably don't know who he is. But those of us who are older than than the millennials, who are older than 30 probably, uh, we know who he is, even though we never probably saw him. And we probably never heard his real voice. You know, kind of like Rich Little, the, uh, the impersonator comedian. The man was so good at doing so many different voices that uh, there are people that didn't really know what his real voice sounded like. Well, this guy was kind of the same way. We all grew up, and we listened to him every Saturday morning, although we didn't know who we were listening to because we thought we were listening to you know, people like Bugs Bunny. We thought we were listening to – we always think this. We think we're listening to Daffy Duck, and we think we're listening to all the cartoon characters. And, and half the time we think that they're all different people, but a lot of times 
it's one person doing multiple voices for these different characters. And this particular character, uh, uh, character voice, what do you say, character voicer? This particular guy did a lot of different voices. His name, if you ever paid attention to the credits, when you, even when you were a kid, I did. I paid attention to the credits. His name was all over the place. He's a popular satirist, and he's also known as the voice of Looney Tunes. In reality, he was a voice actor. Dan Freeberg was 88 when he passed away earlier this week. Stan Freeberg, uh, basically he skewered pop culture and McCarthyism with his satirical records and did cartoon voices for nearly six decades. Passed away of pneumonia and respiratory problems in Santa Monica. He was 88. In no, back in November, Mr. Freeberg, uh, Freeberg was honored by his many friends at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. Harry Shearer was the host, and Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks sent a video tribute from location in Germany. It was the best of, uh, be, it was the best evening of his life, so said his wife. He loved it. He was an incredible man. He did the voices that none of us will ever, ever forget. He began his six-decade career doing impersonations on Cliff Stone's radio program back in 1943. Then he soon began uh, voicing the characters of Warner Brothers cartoons, working with the genre of King Mel Blanc. He voiced uh, Junior Bear... Beaky Buzzard, no Beaky Buzzard, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 and Tosh, one of two goofy gophers opposite blank, but perhaps the young actor's most enduring portrayal was the seemingly slow Pete the Puma, one of my favorite Looney Tunes characters. We all know who Pete Puma is. Bugs Bunny asked him how many lumps of sugar he wanted for his tea. And Pete always answered, oh, three or four. And then Bugs proceeded to pound three or four lumps on his head. He's a part of pop culture. He's a pop culture icon, a pop culture legend. He, like Mel Blanc brought joy to many a child and adult alike throughout the years. He really missed. But let me say, every time, every time, you happen to turn on the TV and you happen to turn on the Cartoon Network or whatever station or network that you're, that you're watching, and you happen to see a cartoon that would happen to be a favorite of yours back in the day. Why don't you hang around long enough to see the, the credits of who's voicing your favorite characters? You might see that one of those characters is voiced by none other than Mr. Freeberg. And then you might have a different appreciation for this gentleman. But I always knew who he was. I had a great appreciation. You will be missed and remembered. Hello, I'm a Democrat, and I'm running for President of the United States. My voting history shows that I've done everything I can to support our minority groups. I want to end the war against illegal immigration, because, after all, they're citizens too. However, my opponent rejects the idea of such acceptance. He's even been seen stopping Hispanics in the street and accusing them of being illegal. From drafting legislation to give free food stamps and welfare to personally distracting the Border Patrol for easier passage, I am truly here for the people. Like the glasses? I can see them. 
And yes, it's true that I voted in favor of funding for Planned Parenthood. I not only advocate, but promote a woman's right to have an abortion. In fact, last week I personally aborted an entire class of third graders. Yet your Republican nominee has been seen at abortion clinics, yelling at rape victims, telling them it was the will of God to bear their child. He has no respect for anyone who isn't also a rich white man, whereas I will give you all free health care, free food, and free abortions. Myself. He forces his religion on an entire nation, whereas I oppose religion in schools and in the home. He tries to portray a healthy marriage, but we all know that's really his sister. On November 6th, Vote for a strong woman fighting for you, not an inbred Texan with a spoon-fed Harvard degree and stupid. I'm your Democratic candidate, and I approve this message. Funded by Tampon, the American Minority Political Outreach Network. Rob Stark. He's the biggest celebrity in the North. But his father was a traitor... He arrested his own mother, his bastard brother deserted the Night's Watch, and he couldn't defend his own castle. Worst of all, Rob Stark hasn't stopped the wildlings from invading our lands and taking our jobs. He even has an illegal alien for a nanny. And now he wants to be king in the north? King? Some people say he's really a wolf. Some people say he eats dead people. We can't wait until it's too late. Send a raven to Winterfell now and tell Rob Stark to go back home. Stop eating dead people and defend the damn wall. This ad paid for by Crossbows GPS. Daenerys Targaryen. She says she is the mother of dragons. But would you trust her with your kids? Her father was a maniac. She palled around with Dothraki terrorists. She asked the city of Carth for a government bailout. Then she lost three baby dragons after placing them in an unlocked wooden box. An unlocked wooden box. This Khaleesi wants to be queen of the seven kingdoms, but can she be trusted? Daenerys Targaryen. Wrong for dragons. Wrong for the realm. Paid for by the committee to protect dragons. We don't know anything about him. He was never really vetted. Is he really the true-born son of Robert Baratheon? All over the Seven Kingdoms, people are asking the same question. Who is the real King Joffrey? The people of Westeros are hurting. Winter is coming. Crop yields are falling. And the price of fuel is going up. The cost of peat moss is through the thatched roof. And this young and inexperienced king takes advice from a whoremongering imp and has launched an illegal war in the north? What is King Joffrey hiding? This is not our kind of family values. King Joffrey, what a bastard. What a bastard. Paid for by the Inbaratians for freedom. On the battlefield, there's a saying America's military men and women live by. Never leave a fallen warrior behind, ever. Off the battlefield, Wounded Warrior Project operates with the same goal. We leave no warrior behind. Wounded Warrior Project is a nonprofit organization created to help our men and women returning home with the scars of war. Whether those scars are physical or mental, we're here to make sure that they heal. And whether it's helping those with post-traumatic stress disorder live a normal life again or giving much-needed support to injured warriors and veterans' hospitals. Because no one deserves our help more than the men and women who risk their lives to keep us safe. Wounded Warrior Project. We never leave a fallen warrior behind. Ever. Learn more about what we do at WoundedWarriorProject.org. The following letters were written by our troops. My dear fellow Americans, I truly appreciate your support. I was starting to wonder if people had forgotten about us over here. But then one of my buddies showed me this website. And now as tears are streaming down my face, I can see for sure that you haven't. Private Emily B., U.S. Army. It's so heartwarming to see the American people not letting the men and women of the armed forces be forgotten. 
Your letters make a group of grown men, battle-hardened and gruff, act like a bunch of kids around a Christmas tree. Thanks. Staff Sergeant Matthew H., U.S. Army. Your support may be the most important thing our troops can carry with them, but don't take our word for it. Take theirs. To show your support, visit americasupportsyou.mil. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Defense and the Ad Council. Modulator. That creature has stolen it. Oh, delays, delays. Ah, uh, yes. Bugs Bunny. You know, the problem is, is I can, I can quote, watch Bugs Bunny and quote a lot of the lines. I don't know. People think I'm crazy and they look at me like I have two heads or something. Anyway, good evening, my fellow Americans. It is I, your lovable host, Elrod, coming to you live from my bunkerized home studio, where the, the motto of the Granite State is still live free or die. It is not big government or bust. It's hour number two of the show here on this Wednesday, Wednesday hump day, April the 8th in the year of our Lord, 2015, as I'm coming to you currently live. And, of course, those of you who are listening out there on the podcast, don't forget that you can still call the show live if you are uh, so inclined to do so at 603 835 322 Four, that's six zero three three eight five three two two four. Look, I know some of you know some of you might. Well, it's, if you don't like me talking about Bugs Bunny, then go ahead and go over to my website and tell me so. That's right, uh, Rod Eccles dot net. That's R O D E C C L E S dot net. Plain and simple. Um, and I, I, I'm a huge Bugs Bunny fan, and it's it's you know you, you lose the voices of your characters, and it's like the characters themselves die uh, because they, in a way, and in, in a sense, they do. Uh, and it is it's sad. It is sad. look. I know we all have to go, but it's it's sad. Uh, these guys brought um, you know Mel Blanc and and Stan Free. Uh, Freeberg and, and and all the people over at Warner Brothers who put together these Looney Tune cartoons, um, as well as a bunch of other of my favorite cartoons. Now I was also a big fan of the Pink Panther, the the Peter Sellers movies, as well as the Saturday morning cartoon. Uh, the Pink Panther, he was one cool cat, man. He was. I know he was pink. But today that's not a cool color for somebody to have, but yeah, you try and tell me that Panther wasn't cool. And uh, Hong Kong Fooey was another one that I loved. I loved uh, Top Cat. Anybody remember Top Cat? Uh, you know, the, the, the original Super Friends. Love that, too. You know, they, they got out. They, today's cartoons just, um, they don't meet up to the stuff that was done back in Warner, the Warner Brothers' heydays up through the 70s. And even the 60s cartoons, even, even if you watch some of the 60s cartoons, like Spin! Ghost. You know, they were very hip at the time. They're very dated because they're very hip and very centered around the 60s and, and, those mo- and the movement era of the 60s. But it, don't tell me that you didn't watch Josie and the Pussycats 
And don't tell me you didn't watch Scooby-Doo. Now, I have to admit, I didn't like Mighty Mouse, but a lot of people did. Here I come to save the day. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Freeberg, no, he didn't, he didn't have his, he didn't lend his voice to a lot of those, but the big ones that we remember from Warner Brothers, he did. So, I, you know, it's pop culture. We talk about pop culture in this show. If we, if today's culture was more, quote unquote, square, like culture of yesterday, our country would be a hell of a lot better off. It really would. I'm not saying going back to the 50s, but hell, just go back to the 70s, man. At least, the, at least then there was still a sense of self-responsibility and, and self-dignity. I don't know, we've lost a lot of it today. Let me tell you. Yeah, and I, I'm reminded in the uh, chat room, Tom and Jerry, one of my favorites. Love Tom. You know the reason why I really loved Tom and Jerry? Because on most of the, the original Tom and Jerry's, their opening credits reminded me of like I was watching, going to watch a movie. I was starting to watch. And they were hilarious. They were hilarious cartoons. And they were so well done. I mean, Tom and Jerry was just, they were, um, they were an amazing cartoon. They were, I know if you look at them today, there, there's a lot of, uh, of the era you know, that they came out of. There's a lot of stereotypes that are in cartoons, and a lot of kids today probably won't get to all those stereotypes. I fully understand that. A lot of, a lot of, little, a lot of uh, you know, underlying racism in, in Tom and Jerry. I get it. it was, they were still hilarious cartoons. Um, you know, but yeah, it, it it was what it was back in the day. But it's still one of my favorites. I remember coming home from school, and and, and Tom and Jerry was one of the cartoons that was one of the afternoon uh, TV shows. I don't think they really do that anymore. Remember the afternoon um, afternoon uh, schoolhouse special, whatever it was. It was like it came on like once a week or something like that. Um. But yeah, yeah, that, those are there, um, and and you know, but I, I was my sister liked Popeye. I wasn't a huge fan of Popeye, but I still watched it. Uh, it was okay in my book, um, and, and there there were there were a bit way too you know numerous. I'm probably forgetting a lot. Even even going into the '80s, uh, there were some cartoons um, I absolutely loved, but. And not so much in the 90s or 2000s. There aren't many because they really started to, excuse my French, suck. It's sticking with the, the pop, pop culture theme right now, and this is something that really does sort of tie into uh, political debate, if you will, especially now with the Indiana thing. Uh, Barry Manilow. And, you know, some of the younger uh, listeners of the program, they may not really know who Barry Manilow is. But Barry Manilow, uh, Barry Manilow is a huge musical icon. Uh, he got started, I do believe, in the, in the early 70s writing jingles. I think he wrote, you know, all the, all the Pepsi jingles of the 70s. Uh, Barry Manilow wrote those uh, and, and many, many others. And then he made it big in the mid and late 70s with, uh, you know, I Write the Songs and Mandy. And he was a huge pop star humong i mean uh he was even though he was older you know he wasn't the, the young little teeny bopper and he definitely didn't get in trouble but he was you know you could equate him to justin bieber of the day uh i mean that that's how huge barry manilow was in at his height um and and he he wrote a lot of songs for a lot of other artists as well uh, and another one is uh, wrote a lot of songs for a lot of other artists and hits, hit after hit after hit. Uh, there are two other notables: uh, uh, Carol King. I mean, I think she's like got like a hundred. She's uh, one of the most prolific hit songwriters ever. And Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees wrote a lot of stuff for a lot of different people, a lot of hits there. But Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow, back in the 90s, it was, well, actually in the 80s, it was rumored, but this was before, you know, it was cool and kosher, 
was rumored that he might be a little gay. And the rumors kind of they, they kind of persisted. You know, is is he is he the the pop culture's liber uh, the pop music world's Liberace? Because basically, that's what that is really how he was. He was what Liberace did the class to classical music and and performance and stage presence, uh, especially in Las Vegas. That's who Barry Manilow was really compared to, and people wondered, is he going to be like Liberace? And then I think sometime in the 2000s he came out. It, well, it, it, or it sort of came out, or he uh, he didn't deny it. Well, today Barry Manilow um, has admitted that he married his manager Gary Keith. So if there was any question about Barry Manilow's sexual preference or sexuality, I think by marrying his his manager, who happens to be a guy named Gary. Uh, should put that to rest. And, of course, this is being touted and lauded. Well, look, Barry Manilow is gay. Barry Manilow can get married. Why can't everybody get married? And gay rights this and gay rights that. I'm just telling you, this is, this is, you know, this is how they use these people, which, by the way, which is why some, you know, cause some people think that, you know, the, the stars that are in the closet, oh, they don't need to be afraid to come out anymore. No, they don't want to come out because it's not that they're afraid. They just don't want to be used for the left, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 that radical left-wing agenda. They don't want to be used for it. Doogie Hauser, otherwise known as Patrick Neil Harris, was pretty clear on that. You know, he once said that he didn't want to get involved in this whole gay rights issue thing because he wasn't he wasn't sure and i quote i'm not sure if i believe in all of that stuff in other words he was referring to he he wasn't particularly sure if he believed in all the stuff that the left the radical left-wing gays and gay agenda were trying to foist upon the rest of us and indeed there are a lot of gay people who are not who do not believe in that the radical agenda so they they pretty much stay in the closet not out of fear of being found out or especially today, because you know it's 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 cool now. If you hey you're gay, oh that's cool. You know Neil Patrick Harris, he's he's gay and he's still a good actor and he's still cool, cool and and he must be a really good actor because you know he plays that womanizer Barney on on How I Met Your Mother, and you would never ever guess that he was gay from that character. And it goes on and on and on. So it, it, it's cool actually to come out a little bit today, in in many cases if you're a celebrity, but. They don't want to be used for as as a as a tool or a weapon in this radical left wing nut jobbery. Look, they're just like the rest of us. They just want to, you know, practice their craft, earn a living, and and just live their lives. They don't want to have, uh, you know, they don't want to have their personal lives uh, put out on display. For everybody, and, you know, I know we often say, well, if, you, if you're going to be a music or, or a movie star or something, then you've got to know that you're always going to be on display. No, 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 that's not true. And you ask any so-called star if they ever thought that they could not keep their private life, their real private life, private. Would they have gone, gotten into the limelight? Most of them say no. Because they believe that what they do in their bedroom and behind closed doors and inside their house is their business. We don't need to know it all. And this is true for this, the, 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 the homosexual stars. Oh, sure, fine. Some of them do come out and, and they say, well, I'm, I'm proud, you know, I'm the, but they don't want to give all the sordid details of their of their private life, and most of them definitely do not want to be used as a tool or a weapon for the to advance the radical left's agenda. And we know this is true of Barry Manilow because let's face it, Barry Manilow is an icon, and he could very well be a very a, a, an outspoken advocate if he wanted to be but he doesn't even talk about it he doesn't like talking about it he doesn't want to talk about it 
You know, people often say, well, how come some of these stars never give interviews or rarely give interviews? It's because they don't want to talk about themselves. Because, and, then they, and, and they know for a, for a fact that every time they sit down in front of Barbara Walters or any other you know, celebrity interviewer, that they're going to get into, their, into their, their lives beyond the realm of none of your business lines. So they don't give them. They don't give interviews. And I, for one, don't blame them. I mean, I, I'm happy to give interviews for me as long as it's based on my show and my political views and, and, and based on public policy and this country. But look, I, I don't like to answer personal questions because they're not anybody else's business. Period. And, you know, I mean, it, it, look, I understand why some of them, you know, they, uh, if they don't answer, then they're considered to be rude. Rude. Oh, well, they're not rude. They're private. And the private part means just that, private. Not public. Not for public consumption. Private. They don't ask the private questions. And look, I don't see Barry Mantle out there doing a, an interview circuit. He's not going around yelling at the top of his lungs, hey, guess what? I'm gay and I got married to a guy. You know, it just sort of came out. But, hey, good for him. I Look, if that's what he wants to do, and if he, as long as he's not trying to foist or push that on other people, I mean, because let's face it, you know, straight people really don't push being straight on other people. You know, it, it, you just are or you aren't. But why is it that... that that some small fraction of a minority feel that it's okay to push homosexuality on all of us and then get mad when we don't accept them. Just saying. Hey, there's some um, hypocrisy going on out there. Some big hypocrisy. And this is in the realm of of so-called equal pay or better pay. Hey, you know, we have all these CEOs that are making huge amounts of money. I mean, they're just making all kinds of money. And and the people that they employ in their businesses that make them so rich are only making like 8 or 9 or $10 an hour. Why don't they give up some of their money? to pay their employees better. Huh? Huh? Why don't they? Huh? And some of these CEOs are out there advocating a raise in the minimum wage. Now, the, the, the funny thing is, I don't know. Now, no, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know of a single company, be they led by a conservative CEO or a liberal CEO, that is paying anybody the minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour or more, unless their community has it in law that they have to. I don't believe that there are. Are there? Uh, somebody tell me if there is, because I don't know. But here we have um, hourly pay for fast food CEO and CEOs is pretty astonishing. This is a Yahoo News story. Basically, as legions of fast food workers and their supporters prepare for a major nationwide strike next week, did you know that there was going to be a a, a nationwide fast food worker strike? Well, I guess you're not going to – look, they better think twice about this because have they they not seen uh, uh, the videos or heard the 911 tapes of these people going into fast food joints like Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's and not being able to get their, you know, their nuggets or their fried chicken. And they go off the wall or they call 911. So, I don't know if you want to piss off these people. You know, these fast food eaters cuz you know, you, they, they, when they want their nuggets or they want their fried chicken, they want it. So they they they're getting some powerful ammunition ammunition in their push for a $15 an hour minimum national minimum wage. 
An analysis published Monday shows just how enormous the chasm be, uh, uh, is between what the average worker makes and restaurant industry CEOs, some of them who are quite liberal in their public views. I, I, uh, let, me, let me just give you an example here. Uh, Chipotle. Uh, this is, and, and they broke this down. Um, I mean, Yahoo News is, is, is reporting something from uh, uh, USA Today. And USA Today broke down the CEO's salaries on, into an hourly basis based on if they work, you know, 40 hours a week, like as if anybody just work, you know, works 40 hours a week anymore. Um, well, some of them can't work 40 hours a week but because they're only part-time. But they're basing it on a 40-hour uh, pay week. Uh, the Ch- Chipotle co-CEO, uh, co-CEO Montgomery Moran, or Moran, M-O-R-A-N, gets the equivalent of $13,489 per hour. I don't, I don't, I don't see anybody in his his Chipotle restaurants making fifteen dollars an hour without tips. Starbucks, Starbucks. This is a company that is supposed to be so uh, conscious and so wonderful towards and so liberal. I mean, this is a company. You know, Starbucks, the company that wanted to have a talk about race. You know, this is the same company that that refuses to put Starbucks stores in many. You know, minority neighborhoods, they've redlined these neighborhoods, and they're not putting stores there. So, but they want, still want to have a race conversation or a conversation about race. So Starbucks, their CEO, Howard Schultz, who also talks about, you know, people not getting paid enough at the lower end of the economic scale and that maybe we should have a higher minimum wage. Well, this guy doesn't pay his baristas $15 an hour uh, willingly and freely. But he makes the equivalent of $10,285 an hour. Oh, that, that seems like a lot to me. And you go down the line, Panera Bread CEO, Ronald Shaich, or Shake, S-H-A-I-C-H, makes the equivalent of $1,292 an hour. You know, the, the, uh, the other Chipotle co-CEO, Steve Ellis, makes $13,471 an hour. You want to know why your coffee's going up? Well, Duncan brand CEO Nigel Travis earns $4,889 per hour. Even the venerable Wendy's and Domino's CEOs, Emil Brolic and Patrick Doyle, make over $3,500 an hour. And yet, they want to be out there to tell us that we should, you know, we should support a minimum wage of $15 an hour. But they're not paying their employees that 15 bucks an hour. No, 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 no. But somehow they think that a law is better to get them to do something that they should probably do on their own since they're advocating it in public policy? I don't know. Hey, look, Starbucks also, if you want to talk about race, how about you start putting some Starbucks restaurants and stores in more diversified neighborhoods? Then you'll get some real talk about race. And start paying these people 15 bucks an hour on your own. Then you might get some support from others who say, that's a good idea. But instead, you'd rather be hypocrites. Hi. Hi. You shouldn't have to pay to talk to the people closest to you or the people who used to be. That's why Umbrella Wireless is proud to announce the new friends, family, and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Now you'll get unlimited calls to your best buddy, your mom, or Cindy once she realizes that you're seriously meant for each other and should stop screening your calls. Now the 30 minutes of agonizing silence where you're both afraid to hang up may drain your battery, but it won't drain your wallet. And you'll get unlimited calls just to check if she still cares enough to pick up, with no extra charges. With a friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan, your phone will automatically answer calls from your ex, because maybe she finally realizes that you're the only one for her and wants to get coffee sometime. Now, after lonely nights of looking at pictures of the road trip you took together when everything was great, your misspelled texts are absolutely free. The only thing you have to pay for is the booze. The friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan, because she wants you back. She just doesn't know it yet.
Some people have had changes in behavior, hostility, agitation, depressed moods, suicidal thoughts, or actions while using the U.S. government. Some people had these symptoms when they began a phone call or verbal discourse with the U.S. government, and others developed them after several weeks of interaction, but have improved after stopping for two or more days. If you or your family notice agitation, hostility, depression, or changes in behavior, thinking, or mood that are not typical for you, or you develop suicidal thoughts or actions, anxiety, panic, aggression, anger, mania, abnormal sensations, hallucinations, paranoia, or confusion, stop all federal government interactions and definitely do not call your doctor as Obamacare has gone into effect. Also, do not contact the U.S. government if you have any history of depression or other mental health problems, as these symptoms may worsen while trying to get anything done in a timely or efficient manner. When you can't find anything to watch on cable, you get bored. When you get bored, you listen to radio cooking shows. When you listen to radio cooking shows, you invite a friend over for dinner. When you invite a friend over for dinner, you use twice as many beans. When you use twice as many beans, you expel deadly farts that kill your friend's dog. When you kill your friend's dog, your friend becomes unstable. When your friend becomes unstable, you're sued for everything you're worth. When you're sued for everything you're worth, you're thrown to the streets. When you're thrown to the streets, you devote your life to world domination. When you devote your life to world domination, you become an evil fascist overlord. When you become an evil fascist overlord, old friends plot their revenge. When old friends plot their revenge, you are shot in the back of the head. And when you're shot in the back of the head, you miss your jazzercise appointment. Don't miss your jazzercise appointment. Upgrade to Indirect TV. Go online or call 1 800 Direct TV. Come on down to the newest pub in Texas, Rednecks, where our beer cans are always full. Don't ask what brand it is, because it all tastes like warm piss. So if you're celebrating a special occasion, like marrying your sister... I do. I did. ...or being named Employee of the Month at Walmart, you're going to want to come celebrate with us at Rednecks Bar and Cantina. And remember, every Friday and Saturday, we have our famous tooth contest. Whoever has the most teeth wins a pair of John Deere mud flaps and a buttery corn on the cob. There's plenty of parking space to drive your house over to Rednecks and come on in and have a hell of a time. We're located right next to Big Al's truck stop, right across the street from the KKK headquarters. Homos and minorities, not welcome. Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like the, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scots peddler. The nastiest, most negative election... And they've been taken dirty to a whole new... It can level. seem like a return to civility is not possible.
And we are back. I am your lovable host, still, Elrod, coming to you live from my bunkerized home studio somewhere within the great granite state of New Hampshire. Don't forget the number that you can call this evening is still 603-835-3224. And, of course, you know, you can still call it. Uh, uh, well, no, you can't call that number to actually listen to the show, but you can call it to be put on the show, and I will, of course, see you in in um, uh, my, my queue, and you get to talk to yours truly me. Uh, that's wonderful news, actually. Don't you think? I, I don't know why people don't think it'd be wonderful to talk to me. So, Well, I know why liberals don't want to talk to me, but um, you know, we won't hold that against you, liberals, if you don't want to talk to me. Uh, well, well, you know, we'll let you st- stand, uh, stay out there and be quiet, but this is a program that allows you to just go ahead and try to espouse what you think and what you believe so you don't have to, you know, be afraid. Um, well, I should, you, you should be very afraid if you're going to talk to me because I'm going to talk to you about logic and facts, and you're going to try to do it on emotion, argue from the point of emotion, but, you know, it, you know it, logic and fact trumps emotion – Every time, it really does. You don't you don't have a shot with uh, you know doing that. So I wouldn't really suggest that you just try to to argue from a standpoint of emotion. You got to have some logic and fact. Now here's a here's what seems to be a new fact on the um, on the abortion issue. I, I know people don't like to get into the abortion issue, but hey, look, this is something that's um, rather important. Important because we always hear from the left that you know we're, we on the right, we're just all we want to do is control a woman's body, and we don't have a right to control a woman's body. But nobody ever stops to consider, uh, at least on the on the left, they don't stop to consider the life of the child. The unborn baby. Well, evidently, regular people are starting to pay attention to uh, the unborn baby, and they're they're expressing their decree of when life begins. Because you know, we always hear about well, when does when does uh, life begin? And I've always said, well, this is, you know, this is pretty simple when life begins. We can just take it from a scientific standpoint. And if we go to the point uh, where we say that life ends, and scientifically and medically stated, we pretty much agree, you know, science and, and medical science pretty much says that when there is no brain activity, then if there's no brain waves at all, then you're gone. You're not coming back. If there is brain activity, even if you're in a coma, then there's a chance for you to come back and live. So we have that as a standard for when a person is dead or not. So if we apply it to the beginning, shouldn't we say, now this is what I always say, well, you know what, let's compromise on when life begins. If we're going to say medic, medical science says that life pretty much ends when there's no brainwave activity, well, how about when there starts to be brainwave activity? And we happen to know that brainwave activity starts sometime at the beginning of the second trimester. So then at that particular point, why can't we compromise and say that's when human life begins? Well, the left, you know, they, they, go, they get beside themselves and they say, no, 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 no. But then the left goes out and makes these laws. You know, the, the, the fetus, it's still a fetus. It's just a lump of flesh. But then those same people will advocate for and get laws passed that say that if you, if you kill a pregnant woman, well, you're, you're, you're probably guilty of, of two murders, not just one, the mom and the unborn child. Well, wait a minute. How can you be guilty of murdering an unborn child? If it's unborn and you're saying that it's just a lump of flesh when it comes to abortion, so if so, let me get this straight. If the mom, now this I've asked this question. If the mom wants to have a late-term abortion, she gets in her car and she's on her way to the abortion clinic. 
wherever it is, it's probably Planned Parenthood, but she's on her way to the abortion clinic. On her way. And she gets T-boned by a driver who runs a red light. Mom and an unborn fetus is killed instantly. Now, this driver, you know, they find out, well, you know, he had a, he had a couple of beers. So now he's going to get tagged with vehicular manslaughter of two people, not one. Well, wait a minute. His mom was on her way to get rid of this kid. But now you're going to say, oh, you know, he killed two people. Well, actually, he only killed one if you're going to follow your logic. See, but you're making these laws based on emotion because, oh, it's so terrible. This guy was driving drunk or under the influence, and he killed this pregnant woman. But on the other hand, you're saying, well, this pregnant woman has a right to end her child's life if she wants to. So the mom has a right to end the child's life, but, uh, but somebody else doesn't who's not a doctor. Yeah, how does that make any logical sense? Well, evidently a lot of Americans think that that's just – that type of thought process is stupid. This is a story from Hot Air. Here's a poll. 52% of Americans say life begins at conception. Not sometime after, not in the second trimester, not in the third trimester, not when the kid is born, not when the kid takes his first breath, but at conception. So that ends that argument as far as I'm concerned about when does life begin because, you know, we're always told, well, the majority, you know, the majority of Americans want gay marriage, and the majority of Americans want equal rights, and the majority of Americans want this, and the majority of Americans believe that there should be a woman's right to choose. And the jo- well, hey, guess what? The majority of Americans say life begins at conception. Now, um, here's part of the story that was on in, in hot air. Uh, police said uh, – Lane, this is, and this is in March, the Boulder uh, County District Attorney's Office announced that uh, Danell Lane would not be charged with murdering Michelle Wilkins' seven-month-old baby. Now, Lane attacked a pregnant Michelle Wilkins with a knife, cutting out her baby in the Malay. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty gruesome. Now, police said Lane, who was a Colorado certified nurse's aide, Attack Wilkins, who's 26 years old, on March 18th at Lane's apartment um, in uh, Glen Place in Longmont, Colorado. Now, Wilkins went to the home at about 11.51 a.m. to respond to a Craigslist ad, uh, ad of baby clothes for sale. Now, Lane's husband, David Ridley, came home at 2.15 p.m. to take his wife to a prenatal checkup. He was met at the stairs by Lane, who was covered in blood. Now, she told her husband that she had a miscarriage and that the baby was in the bathtub upstairs. Now, Ridley uh, said he rubbed the baby slightly, then rolled it over to hear and see it take a gasping breath. Now, Wilkins, who was wounded in the basement, called 911 at 2.41 p.m. Lane was arrested at Longmont United Hospital at 7.46 p.m. So this woman decided that she was, you know, going to take somebody else's baby. But was it a baby? Well, in order for it to be a baby, it had to have personhood before it was ripped out of its mom's womb because it didn't go to full term. So this whole notion that life doesn't begin at at conception I believe, is a false narrative and false notion simply because the left wants to have evilness alive and well in this country. Because on one end, they don't want you to tell them what to do, but on the other end, they want to tell the rest of us what to do all the time. And then they base some of their laws on emotion. Well, you know what? The kid is not a kid until... You kill it, then it's a kid. But before you kill it, it's not a kid. Well, how can you kill it if it's not alive? Well, the majority of Americans have said, you know what? Enough of that BS. Life begins at conception. And maybe our law, maybe our laws should be reflected around that. And if we did that, if life, if we accepted life begins at conception, well, I guess that means. 
you really can't have abortion on demand, then can you? And that, folks, is what it's all about, having abortion on demand. And they will give you this false notion, well, yeah, these, these Republicans and these, these evil uh, conservatives, they don't, they, they don't want you, they want to force you to have the kid, even if it's in, you know, in the case of rape or incest, or even if it's going to affect the mom, mama's life like killer. Yeah, you know, killer dead. And, and for most Republicans and constitutional conservatives, that is not what we're saying at all. But we are saying that abortion on demand could be dead. And, and evidently, the majority of Americans would tend to agree with that sentiment because the majority of us believe that life begins at conception. Well, going from the beginning of life to what should be the end of life, uh, here's a story from the Washington Post about John McCain, that that venerable senator from out in the Southwest. If McCain wins in 2016, he won't necessarily be the oldest. In fact, he will be fairly young by Senate standards. So when McCain ran for president back in 2008, so the story goes, the report goes, uh, some commentary focused on the age gulf between him and Barack Obama. So McCain's announcement Tuesday that he will seek a sixth term in the Senate in November for 36 total years, uh, if he's elected, uh, suggests that he must be near the upper end of the age range of the Senate, but uh, which you know he really is. But if McCain, who is now 78, is reelected, uh, which is in 2016, which means he'll be what the, the, the I don't know his birthday come in time by the time then he'll be 80, will be 79 or 80. Uh, he probably won't even be one of the oldest senators in the 115th Congress, le- much less in history. McCain is is so young by Senate standards that former Senator Strom Thurmond was uh, won election three times when he was older than the Arizona Republican will be in 2016. The two other senators won election twice at ages older than McCain will be in January of 2017. And at least five senators, three of whom will be in the middle of their terms when the next Congress rolls around, will be older than McCain uh, when he is sworn in again. I, I, look, we've got we've got this whole notion of old white men uh, running the country is 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 not all that far fetched. Actually, it's the truth. let me let me run down some ages here uh, that uh, that uh, of people in in Congress. It's really quite frightening. Now, right now, we've got um, uh, there are some I can't count them all. But there have been, over the past few years, oh, let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20, 35, 40, over 50, 50 senators in, in, in um, uh, age 2000, in 2017 are, are starting a new term in the Senate. It looks like there's about 50, just slightly less than 50 of them. Uh, it looks like they're greater than 80 years old. I, I mean, th- this, is, this is amazing. No, Strom Thurmond, um, almost 100. You had Robert Byrd, who died in office. He was like almost 90. And, and you have it going down the list, and uh, a Byrd, who, who, who uh, uh, or excuse me, Orrin Hatch is over 80. Uh, who are some others here that people may know uh, that are really famous? Diane Feinstein. Well, this might explain why she's such an idiot. She's over 80. Uh, you know, Pat Roberts uh, is over 80. John McCain will be over 80. Uh, James Inhofe from Hawaii is 80. No wonder we got these, these. We're talking geriatrics here. There's probably, you know, everybody was talking about Ronald Reagan maybe having Alzheimer's. I'm sure there's quite a few Alzheimer's victims in this list of senators. 
Uh, Harry Reid is, is, is retiring, but, you know, he's near – well, he's, he's like 76 or something. He's nearing 80. And I, I know it's hard to tell what, uh, you know, the, the Valley girl, how old she is because of all the plastic surgery. And I'm assuming she's had – it hasn't really helped. And she's like 70-something. I do. I could be wrong about her. I, but she's up there. She's older than Hillary, right? I mean, this is uh, the, these people are, are just they're they're too amazing. They should not be in office. There, uh, well, look, there is a time when it's time to move on and get somebody. I'm going to have to say it younger. I, I'm sorry, you've been in office what thirty years. Are you kidding me? That should not happen. I don't care what your age is when you're elected, as long as you have your faculties and you can think straight. I agree with that. However, if you've been there for four or five terms already, you're old and stale at any age. It's time for somebody new. You're not the only qualified person in your district that can hold your seat. Get out of the way. This is why we need term limits. Because term limits would prevent all these geriatrics from, well, there's all that experience, Rod, and wisdom of age. Well, really? Are you, go- are, are, are you going to infer that wisdom onto Harry Reid? Have we lost all sensibility? You're going to infer wisdom on the on the uh, uh, you know uh, Inhofe, one of the most liberal people out there, senators. You going to you going you going to uh, uh, infer that wisdom over to Nancy Pelosi, Barbara Feinstein, Feinstein? How about Maxine Waters? How old is that bat? I mean, really seriously, we we got to infer. Wisdom onto those idiots? You know, wisdom does not necessarily come by age. I, I know some, you know, some 18 to 20-year-olds that are very wise. And I, I know some 60-year-olds that are just very immature and unwise and stupid. And it, that's the same for being in Congress whether it be in the House or the Senate, there are some in there that, that, are, that are pretty wise at a young age and those that have been around for a long, long time. I mean, you wonder, seriously wonder, if they have all their faculties. Because when they open their mouth, I mean, even, even, their, own, even their own supporters, sometimes their jaws drop and hit the floor. I mean, th- th- she said, what? We have to... Pass the bill in order to find out what's in it. I'm sure there are, you know, plenty of her staffers that were running around thinking, "Oh my God, how are we gonna, how are we gonna spin this one?" Not gonna be easy to spin that. There's another poll out there. You know, I know for a person who really doesn't like polls too much, I seem to find them a lot. Well, they come across my news feed, and I just, they, they grab my attention because of the headline. And then they say, they give me all this stupid information. And again, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of polls. I don't care if they support my, my theory uh, or my, my political view or personal view or not. I don't really believe in polls because polls can be manipulated. However, there is some truth in the polls, especially when they're done by liberal organizations or liberal-leaning poll takers with a liberal-leaning poll question, and the number still comes out to be a majority on the conservative side. I then realized that if they're asking in such a way as to get a more liberal response and they're still getting the majority as conservatives, well, uh, conservative thought, well, that means that a vast more uh, majority – of those being polled, as well as those not being polled, are more conservative than liberal. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't deny that. I mean, if you get an ABC, CNN poll or something like that, and it says, you know, uh, 60% of American people believe that, you know, in this, cons- in this, this way, and it's conservative in thought. Well, if CNN is involved, 
You know, that's probably down by 10 points, so it's probably the number is probably closer to 70%. Just saying, this is, this is how you have to look at the polls, and it shouldn't be that way, but look, the, the lame stream media shouldn't be the way that it is either, but it is. So you have to look at each part through a filtered lens in order to get a, a good idea of what the truth is. But here's another poll, and <laughs> I got to tell you, I, I, and this is a uh, Newsmax, and I got to tell you, I, 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 I'm thinking it's probably not too far off. But this is a poll on, on Obama, and the poll basically says that Obama is far more popular in Cuba then in the USA, the results of a new poll shows that President Barack Obama is far more popular in Cuba than he is in the United States. This is a uh, Bendixson and Amandi poll for Univision, <laughs> Nita, Nita, I can't, Fusion, uh, no, no CS Fusion, uh, Hispanic, obviously, Spanish. Uh, it finds that 46% of Cubans hold somewhat of a positive, a positive opinion of Obama, while another 34% have a very positive opinion of, of him. Now, this Univision uh, Noticias Fusion obviously is, you know, because you're looking at Univision, it's, it tends to be a little bit on the liberal side. But basically, it says uh, uh, combined, that, uh, that amounts to about an 80% approval rating, which is much higher than Obama's approval number in the U.S., which is currently at 47%. Now, the Fusion poll found that Cuban President Raul Castro approval rating is at 47% in Cuba. Wow, don't they have something in common? How do you like that? Well, <laughs> I'm out of time for tonight. I'm Rod Eccles. I will catch you back here at the same bad time tomorrow. Until then, stay free. <laughs>